preached into this several weeks ago, and we've had a, lo a lot of different things happening in between, and uh, some starts and some stops, and we're just continuing with Malachi. Um, you remember the theme of Malachi is the faithfulness of God. We love to talk about the faithfulness of God. We love to tell the story of God and his faithfulness. And the theme of Malachi is really the faithfulness of God with, uh, against the backdrop of the unfaithfulness of his people. And God, through the prophet Malachi, is addressing some specific issues of unfaithfulness. And he's bringing indictments against the people. And it's interesting as we read through this, again, every time God brings an indictment, the people dispute it. God says, you've done this. And they say, but, but how? God says, you, you failed to bring me an offering. They say, well, what do you mean? What do you mean? So we looked at that. And, and by the way, I just have to let you know that this morning... We're going to have a change in plans. Change in plans. In fact, uh, you may see in your, on, on the bulletin, uh, and saw this last week, that we were intending to do divine economy. Are you robbing me, God says? And the people say, how are we robbing you? We're not going to get to that today. Because I want to back up and just kind of cover something we, we didn't quite get to last time as we look at this. And it's a change of plans. So you remember last week as we brought um, the Word of God. We're in chapter 3, and, and God was addressing some specific issues, and, and really the complaint to the people, where's the God of justice? And God kind of in his answer, my, my paraphrase of his answer, you want to know where the God of justice is? Here's what I'm about to do. I'm about to bring that justice, but who can endure it? You're calling for justice in the world. You're calling for me to come and to smite those evildoers, but really who can endure when, when justice comes? You're not as innocent as you claim to be. And then he unfolds this, and it's a wonderful promise. It's a wonderful picture of Christ, that he's coming like a refiner's fire, but he's also coming like a fuller's soap. A refiner's fire with that intensity that can't be resisted, and he's going to remove all that is impure, and then he's coming as a fuller soap. He's going to make clean that which is not clean. As we looked at that last week, we realized that it's a great picture. It had a near application that God was going to address the specific issues of specific people at a specific moment in history. But it also had a far application as it pointing to, pointed to and anticipated what we now know that Christ has done and continues to do. And that he will do when he comes back as a, that refiner's fire. And so we, we'll look at that application. But in that, we didn't quite get to these verses 5 and 6 of chapter 3. Did I give you long enough to find Malachi? Good. Malachi chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, just speaking of, of his coming. Um, verse 5 says... And I will draw near to you for judgment. And I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, against those who swear falsely, against those who oppress the wage earners in his wages, the widows and the orphans and those who turn aside the alien and those who do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed. So what we have here, and we didn't quite get to this, but what we have here is, is God saying, I'm going to come and I'm going to bring the justice. You're wondering where I am and you're wondering what I'm doing about this. I'm about to come and I'm going to address something. Now, in, in that bigger picture, he's talking about the corruption of their worship. And we just understand these verses as I'm going to address in that near application in your, in your application, he's saying to his people centuries ago, I'm going to address the things that corrupt worship. And, and he lists seven things here. And we want to just spend some time looking at these seven things, these seven conditions that tended to corrupt their worship. God says, I'm going to be a witness against that. And so when I come, and by the way, who's going to endure that? Because here are the things I'm going to address. And you'll see that you're not as innocent as you claim to be. Before we look at that, let me just say a word about worship and coming to know the Lord and coming to worship the Lord. He's addressing these issues, but let's not make the jump to say, God requires us to clean up our life and be perfect before we come to worship him. That's backwards. Because the truth is, we can't clean up our lives and become perfect. 
before we worship him. So we come with all of our messiness. We come with our stain. We come with our fumblings and stumblings and bumblings. We come with the, with the ugliness and the failure. But we come with a sincere heart. Now, the other side of that is this. If we come with those things that we cherish, the sin that we cherish, we come and we know that God wants to address it, but we're not willing to address it. And we come and, and we, with the attitude that God is going to have to be okay with it because that's what he's going to get from us, then the Lord will address that. God has a way of addressing the sin in our life that we like to hang on to. So with that as a backdrop, let's look at these conditions. Seven things that he lists here. These are seven conditions that tend to corrupt worship. Tend to hold us back in worship. In fact, we might say it this way. These are the things and the worship that God would, would not accept, that he would reject, that he wants to address in our lives. We read the statements here. Let's read them once again. This is in chapter 5. Then I will draw near for you, to you for judgment, and I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, against those who swear falsely, against those who oppress the wage earner in his wages, the widows and the orphans, and those who turn aside the aliens and do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed. Now, I, I don't know about you, but, but often when I come to lists like this, indictments like this, that first cursory reading as you just read it on the surface level, it, it's easy to read that and say, whew, I'm, I'm good. I'm in good shape here. I'm sorcery, I've never practiced incantations. I must be good. Against the adulterers, still married to my first wife. She's my best wife, by the way. Still married, okay, so I'm good. And so I read it, and it's really easy for us in this list, in any list, just to kind of read it on the surface level and say, well, it doesn't apply to me. But God really bring that to those sinners out there. But when we stop and we look at it, we unfold it a little bit, and we look a little deeper, we realize, yeah, maybe maybe not the, the first obvious application of that, but when we look at the heart, the heart condition, it hits home a little bit. We want to look at that, just kind of unfold those briefly this morning. What, what about the sorcerer? The sorcerer, you know, we, we think about incantations and, and those who practice dark arts of magic. But what about this? What if we just define that differently? The, the sorcerer would apply to those who look to something other than God as a source of power and a source of guidance in their life. You look to something other than God as a source of power and a source of guidance in your life. And you know now, the, the ramifications of that, the applications of that are, are, are just across the board. Uh, we could look at uh, sorcery. We could look at Satanism and witchcraft and Wicca and all of that. But some things that are almost mainline, even in the church, you, you open the paper and read your horoscope. You look into that power as a guidance in your life. Do you, do you trust the power of crystals? Do you trust the power of, of the healing of the mind, that your mind is the greatest thing in the universe and you can, you can heal yourself, you can make your life better by thinking wholly or correctly? Are you looking to something other than God to bring that healing? See, th there's a recognition. I think God puts in our hearts this recognition that there is something out there. There's a power out there that's beyond us. I think that's just kind of universal in the human heart. But what are you going to look to? What are you going to look to as that power that is beyond us? What are you going to look to? What are you going to be fascinated by? You know, we could even take this to, to a fascination with, with ghosts. Fascination with extraterrestrials. And ascribe to them power, guidance, understanding. If you're looking to something other than God as a source of power and guidance in your life, you're looking in the wrong spot. And so we understand how God is saying this. That this, this is corrupting worship. And, and if I could just maybe give these other words that don't, God doesn't want that kind of worship. Don't come to worship God as a power. Now understand that. We, we do come to worship him as the 
power. He's the creator of the universe. He's the sustainer of the universe. But don't come to worship him as a power. Don't come to worship him just so you can cover all your bases, that you trust the power of God, but you also trust the power of and fill in anything there. God doesn't want you to worship him as a power, as a source of guidance, as a entity that is beyond you. He is the, the one and only. And so he says, this is corrupting. In the same way, we can look at the adulterers. The adulterers. So what is that? Well, you know, the, the obvious application is in that marriage relationship. But if we just kind of expand that a little bit, the adulterers, this is just that characteristic of unfaithfulness. Do you come with a characteristic of unfaithfulness? And, and of course, the obvious application and the best application as we look at this word is just in, the, in that marriage covenant. That are, are you faithful to your promise to, to your spouse, to your husband, to your wife? And God often uses that, especially in the Old Testament, as a picture of our relationship with him. But are you somebody who is faithful? Or are you characterized by unfaithfulness? And it's, it's applied to that marriage relationship, but, but it can be applied to other relationships. How about your, your business relationships? Are, are, you, are you somebody who is faithful to your promises? When you say you're going to do something, do you do it? Do you just make promises lightly and then not carry through that? And of course... And I could just kind of alluded to this already, but it applies to your relationship with Christ, your spiritual life. Do you follow through? We sing about it. We say, you know, I love you, Lord. I lift my voice to worship you. That God, you have my heart. And we talk about God owning our heart and, and that we're faithful to God, but are you faithful to that? So how does that impact worship? And once again, as we look at that, we realize that this is maybe a symptom of corrupt worship, that we don't come with faithfulness. And God doesn't want us to come as an unfaithful worshiper. God doesn't want our worship when part of our heart is reserved for another. doesn't want a half worship. doesn't want half of our heart. He doesn't want half of our devotion. And we can almost hear God saying, if you're not going to come with your whole heart, don't come. Because that's corrupt. I'm not going to accept that. I'm not going to say that that's okay. Because, because that's what we do. We begin to compromise out of complacency. And complacency leads to compromise. And compromise leads to corruption. And in that corruption, we, we just begin to think that's normal. And God's okay with it if we come with half-hearted devotion. If you're not going to come with your whole heart, don't come. Don't come. It's corrupt. God says, I'm going to address that. Now, not only that, but he goes on here. Um, he's going to address the sorcerers, the adulterers, those who swear falsely. Now, it's interesting how he just kind of morphs and gets all of these, and, and we wonder, well, what does that have to do with reestablishing pure worship? Because that was his intent. Establish pure worship and reestablishing the blessing that was going to come from that. So how does swearing falsely fit into that? Well, again, let's look at maybe the bigger definition, an umbrella definition. This is just the, the deception that is for selfish ends. You, are you one who practices deception for selfish ends? And again, the spectrum of application of that just that outright lie that you present something that is far from truth and you present it as truth so that you gain something, so that you take advantage of people, so that you look good, so people will think highly of you. It, it's presenting that which is lie as truth. Do you do that? Just to elevate yourself? And, of course, that's one application, but then we realize that there's more than one way to lie more than one way to swear falsely. And, and we could apply that just as a misrepresentation of the truth. Say things, and, and everything in that could be correct, but it's a misrepresentation. I'll, I'll give you that example. You know, um, well, maybe you know, I like baseball. I've always liked baseball. One of the things that I just am really proud of in my life that... Um, I got to play college baseball. wasn't recruited. 
didn't didn't receive a scholarship. I walked on to the team, and and I'm really proud of working hard to earn a spot on the team. Probably the second best thing about college. First best thing is I met Donna. I got points for that, by the way. Second best thing about college was was playing baseball, and and I, I enjoyed it, and I worked hard. And my junior year, I led the team in fielding percentage. In fact, I didn't, cre- uh, didn't commit an error my enti- the entire season, my junior year. 1,000% fielding. Nobody came close to that. Pretty proud of that. Now, everything I just told you is absolutely true. But, but in reality, there's a misrepresentation of the truth there. When I told you I, I went through the entire season my junior year not committing an error, what I didn't tell you is I only played a total of six innings in the outfield that whole season. And in four of those innings, a ball wasn't hit anywhere close to me. So in the whole season, I had two opportunities to field the ball. One I caught. The other was hit over my head, and I chased it down at the fence and threw it back. 1,000% fielding. Now, I could misrepresent the truth and make you think that, man, I was, I was a pretty decent baseball player. What I was is a really good scorekeeper in college baseball because my, my position really was sitting at the end of the bench keeping the book, and I loved it. I loved it. But, but you see how we do that? How we can misrepresent the truth to build ourselves up, to make ourselves look good, and everything I told you was absolutely true, and you thought I was a ball player there for a minute. But do we do that in other areas of life? Do we swear falsely? Do we tell what is not absolutely true to make ourselves look good? And then we, we bring that back to this idea of worship. When we come to worship God, are we presenting ourselves in a way that makes ourselves look good so that we would be built up, so that others would think better of us? Do we present ourselves in, in a way to God that we, we try to spin the truth and look good to God because we think he's going to be more accepting of us? And, and do we do that with one another? We just kind of put on that, that false front, that facade, so that other people would think we've got it all together. God says we're going to address that. God really is, and you see this, this statement, God doesn't want your worship if you're coming to make yourself look good. Don't come to church so that other people will think highly of you. Oh, what a fine, upstanding citizen. Don't come to church pretending that you've got it all together because we come with all of the messiness and the hurts, with the fumblings and bumblings and stumblings. And we come and we just say, God, this is, this is what I've got. So you work with change me. God isn't really impressed when we talk a good game. He says, let's address that. The next ones we have to kind of read carefully here. Because when we, if, if we read it carelessly, we can almost get the impression that God is against widows and orphans. Did you notice that when I read it? Verse 5, Then I will draw near to you for judgment, and I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, against those who swear falsely, against those who praise to oppress the wage earners in his wages, the widows and the orphans. What? God against widows and no. So we just insert the phrase, those who oppress the wage earners and those who oppress the widows and the orphans. So what about this? Oppressing the the wage earners. Well, um, Give it this umbrella definition. Failure to give what is due. God says, I, I'm against those who just don't give what is due. And obviously, there's an application here for kind of that employer-employee thing. You're not pay, paying your employees. God says, I'm against that. But again, bigger application. Do you give what is due? Do you pay what is due and we could think of your financial obligations are you paying your bills on time giving what is due but it even beyond that realm of finances do you give honor to those whom honor is due 
give respect to those whom respect is due? Do you give praise to those whom praise is due or thanks? Or, or, or are you hoarding that for yourself? And here's the common thing in all of that. It's this attitude, this wrong thinking, that if I give out, I can't keep for myself what I want. And it obviously applies to the employer and the employee. If I give my employees the wages that are due, well, I can't keep for myself what I'd like to have. But we also apply it to that attitude of, I'm not going to give praise and thanks to other people because I want to take the praise for myself. I'm not going to give thanks to other people because I want them to thank me. I'm not going to give honor because I want the honor. Are you withholding that which is due? Now, that impacts worship. It impacts worship in that same way. And, and here's, here's how I would just understand that, that God doesn't want worship and he doesn't want you to come and worship if your true desire is to honor and bless yourself if your true desire is to honor and bless yourself then you've elevated yourself to where God needs to be and God says that's not what worship is about we're going to address that because I want pure worship I want worship where your, your desire is to honor me to give me what is due now, it continues, and really the next part is kind of the, the second part of that. It, God is against those who oppress the widows and the orphans. And we might look at that just the continuation. That's the failure to, it's the failure to care for those who can't care for themselves. It's the failure to, well... Yeah, how do I want to say this? It's up on the screen. You know, it, it's just that attitude of taking advantage of others who are in need. Taking advantage of the misfortune of others. And we can think, you know, the detestable, the, the one who really just pounces on somebody who has had misfortune. We, unfortunately, we're seeing kind of illustrations of that with storms and floods. And then the looters come in and on top of the misfortune, they take advantage of that. And God says, that's pretty detestable. Like, that's pretty evil. But even failing to give, even failing to help those who are, who are without help, to failing to help those who can't help themselves. And just cut to the underlying, the underlying attitude and the underlying assumption. We fail to help those who can't help themselves because... Because we're not focused on the needs of others. We're just focused on what we want. And so God would address this kind of worship by saying, don't, don't come and ask me to bless you when you're callous to the needs of those around you. We're pretty good at coming to asking God, you know, God bless me, God meet my needs. But when there are needs around you and you are aware of those needs, this isn't a case of ignorance, but you're aware of the needs, but you're callous to those needs and you're just focused on, on what you want and what you need. God says, how do you want me to bless that? How do I bless that? That's corrupt. We're going to address that. Don't come and ask God to bless you if you're callous to the needs around you, of those around you. And, and then this one, and this is kind of the continuation, those who would turn aside the aliens, those who aren't, native born God is pretty clear about this in his word by the way read all through the Old Testament especially in giving the law and the requirements and the statutes of the law it's really interesting when we we look at that we realize God says this is going to be a statute for you and your children and and your servants they've got to follow this too and the aliens who are living among you and time after time, God says, this is what I want you to do. This is how you live. It's for you. It's for your household. It's for those who are living among you who aren't native born. And, and here's the reason why. God says, this is, this is the standard, and I want you to live this. And, and, and those around you, I want you to bring them in. I want you to encourage them to live this too, as opposed to ignore them and let them do their own thing. This is the standard of where blessing is. Bring them into it. This is where, how I'm going to bless you and how I want you to live so that things go well. Bring them into that too. As opposed to keep them at arm's length. And they're on their own. In fact, a couple places. In Leviticus 19, 
it is one place specifically where, where God says, you've got to treat them like somebody who is native born. You've got to treat them as one of your own. You've got to love them like you love your own family. Bring them into that. And here's the reason why. Because you were once aliens too. You were once living in a foreign land and I kept my promise on you. God says, I've got a heart for this. And it's interesting too how sometimes in that instruction, God lumps all this together that here's your instruction for you and you, you've got to just be concerned with, you've got to care for those who can't care for themselves. You've got to care for the widows and the orphans and those who are living among you. You have to do that. I want you to do that. The underlying characteristic and why God would address this and be so serious in addressing this because there's an assumption here that I think God finds detestable. And the assumption is this. Let's say it this way. Don't assume that your fortunate condition is deserved. Don't assume that the blessing that you are enjoying is deserved and, and because it's deserved, you're under no obligation to help those who don't have it. See, we get that mindset that, yeah, then they should have done what is right because look what they get. We think that we get what we deserve and they're getting what they deserve. That's a wrong assumption. Don't assume that your fortunate condition is deserved because I've blessed you in spite of what you deserve. Now, you're going to grab a hold of that. You're going to extend that to those around. The last thing he mentions, we'll look at this very quickly here. The last thing that he mentioned is this failure to fear God. And you know, maybe this is, this is the real issue here. And the failure to fear God is the thing that's, that results in all of those other conditions. We fail to fear God, and so we exalt something other than God. We look to some other source of power. We fail to fear God and we exalt ourselves and think more highly of ourselves. We fail to fear God and we don't do what he has commanded us to do. God says, I'm against those. I am against those who fail to fear me. I, I want to put this statement up and I want you to write this down. I want you to think about this. I think this is true. Here's the statement. The failure to fear God is to assume that he is a God who can be managed. Think about that. If we don't fear God, we, we work with this assumption that he's a God who can be managed. Are you God's manager? Is he a God who can be managed? And if you have that assumption that he's a God who can be managed, he is a God that is a product of your imagination. And you notice on the screen, capital G and little g, because at that point, he's not really God. A God who is the product of your imagination is not the true God. Think about the reality of that. If we don't fear him, and by the way, you, you might ask the question, does, does fearing God really mean fearing God? It doesn't really mean fear God, does it? Here's my answer. Yeah, it does. <laughs> kind of believe that the word of God says what it means and means what it says. God to be feared. And, and the problem is we, we try to wrestle with that. Well, how do we reconcile fear of God if we're trembling before him and the fact that he's a God of love? Would, would we really fear a God who has demonstrated his mercy? And you know what? Don't try, to, don't try to just wrestle those two and say one is not true because of the other. Radical center. Both are absolutely true. He is a God not to be trifled with. He is a God to be He is not a God that we can manage. And manipulate. We need to hold him in absolute esteem. And yet, at the same time, you know what is absolutely true? He's a God who has demonstrated his love for us. God says, this has corrupted your worship. You come to me with these attitudes and these actions, and I'm finding it detestable. So when I come, you're asking for the God of justice to come. We're going to address it. You, we're going to address it. And of course, it's got the near application. Because God was talking to a specific people at a specific time, specific period of history, specific issues, but he also addresses us. And I go back to verse 6, and this is kind of our theme verse. For I, the Lord, do not change. Wow, what a truth there. 
And if God doesn't change, then here's what we know to be true. The warning still applies. God found these characteristics detestable with his people centuries ago, and Malachi addressed it. How does he feel about it now? Still calls it detestable. We need to address it. The warning still applies, but you know what? The promise remains as well. It's the great thing about Malachi. Is even though God addresses these issues specifically, we see his faithfulness. That in Christ, in Christ we are made new. In Christ, that which is impure is removed. In Christ, that which is unclean is made clean. And God, in that same sense, is, is saying, we're going to address it. And it might not be easy. You might not like to hear what I have to say. But we're going to address it. You know why? Because I don't change. So if we're going to ad address this, you know, we two options. Either I change or you're ch you change. Guess who's not going to change? going to address this so that worship could be restored a pure worship can be restored so that the blessing can be restored and that's what God is about what are you bringing to him to worship any of those things begin to echo in your heart and your mind kind of nibble at your soul to say wow I didn't realize that that's what I've been doing the promise remains. God makes clean what is unclean. Maybe it's a time just to yield that to the Lord and say, change my life and change my heart and change my attitude and my actions so that what I bring to you is worthy of what you have given to me and that's salvation in Christ. And by the way, if you don't know that salvation today, I need to pray with you and show you how you can know that. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the reminders of your love and your mercy, the reminders of blessing, the joy that it brings. And we thank you for the reminders of, of how we fail to measure up. We thank you for the reminders that are difficult and uncomfortable to hear. But, Father, in all of that, we know that you are at work because you don't change. We thank you that your desire is to restore and redeem us so that we might bring to you worship that is holy and pure, so that we might enjoy all of the blessing that you've meant for us from the beginning. That's where we want to be. Father, we thank you for Jesus, who died in our place. We grab a hold of that truth and that promise by faith. We take you at your word. Now, Father, take us, take us as your own. We pray that you would dismiss us from this place today with blessing. Let your word continue to echo in our hearts and in our minds and shape our lives. And all of this we pray.